Let's think show.com. Welcome to the Let's Think Show. We're going to have a fun time today just discussing a number of random topics. Uh, we're going to just kind of talk about Bitcoin a little bit and and banking and, and how money works. And we'll just have a good old time thinking deeply because that's what we do here on the Let's Think Show. Let's think show.com is our website. And uh, well, let's dive right into it. Let's look at the idea of money. What is money? Well, money is essentially a medium of exchange. It's a symbol. And a lot of people would disagree with me that money is a symbol. They would say that some money has actual value uh, beyond just being symbolic. And yeah, that's that's true. Some money does. Gold, for example, has a value that I guess you can, uh, electricity conducts through it well or inducts or, or whatever electricity does with metal stuff. Uh, it goes through it well. Uh, so it, it does have a functional purpose outside of just being a symbol of value. Um, but then there's there's this argument also that that what creates value in money is the fact that work has to be done to create it. Well, but it can't be flipped the other way. Not everything that requires a lot of hard work has value. 90% of people who have started restaurants can attest to that because they go out of business within 10 years. So when people say that Bitcoin, just because there is work that has to be done to create it, well, no, it's not just work. Work itself doesn't create anything of value. Uh, there are a lot of government bureaucrats that work <laughs> really long, hard hours. Now, nah, I'll take that back. There are a lot of government bureaucrats that work really hard here and there, but but they don't produce anything of value. So it, it can't just be work that creates a thing. But then on the other hand, that is kind of something to keep in mind, right? Because you think about gold. You have to work hard to get gold out of the ground. Somebody has to mine it, and then somebody has to melt it down and pour it into the little cube bar things. So work has to be done to produce it. But it seems like there's something that's even more important than work that gives something value. And we're going to get to the punchline in a bit, but a, another thing is that that is important in money is that there's a limited amount of this symbol. And if you imagine a Monopoly game and everybody starts out with, I don't know, $2,000 and there are four players, so there's $8,000 sitting on the table. Well, if somebody walks up and, and dumps down another 8,000 or another $80,000 worth of money, well, then the, the dollars that you had before are now worth hardly anything. So I guess there has to be a limit to how much there is of a thing. And that's one of the arguments for gold is that, and silver, is that we have a pretty good idea, the geologists have a pretty good idea how much gold and silver there is out there that hasn't been harvested or mined yet. Well, that's another good argument for Bitcoin. We don't, uh, you know, we, we, we have a pretty good idea what the maximum is that will ever be mined. And there's, what is it, 21 or 23 million, something like that. I mean, that's a most Bitcoin that can ever exist. And the geologists will tell us that however many ounces is the most gold that can ever exist. And so that, that kind of does add value to those, those two things. And then if we look at that and we compare that to something like the U.S. dollar, the, the Federal Reserve note, I guess back in the day, wasn't it uh, until 1911 or something when the central bankers kind of got really strong and in charge? But I think up until that point, or maybe it was even later than that, uh, letsthinkshow.com is, is our website. If you would go into show notes and leave a comment or something, if you know the date that this happened. But at some point, there, there was no longer any 
uh, fixed amount. It was when they quit using the gold standard. So it used to be if you had a, a, a dollar bill in the United States, that thing was a, a promise. It was a promise that if you walked into a bank and you handed it to the person, they'd give you a dollar's worth of gold. And then after some time, somebody will correct me on the year, after some amount of time, that gold was taken away. It was taken out of the picture. And then people were told, no, it's still worth a dollar. And of course, we saw what happened from 1911 or 12 or whenever uh, the Federal Reserve came into being. From that point until 2020, the, the dollar has lost, what is it, 97, 98% of its value? So in other words, if you had stuck a, a dollar bill under your mattress in 1911, and then you pulled it out this year, uh, you would take it in and it would only be worth two or three cents. It's just, it's it's gone to being worth hardly anything. And that's called inflation. When you have something that was worth something at one point, but then there are so many more things just like it now, uh, that's inflation. So now, instead of having that same dollar bill, that back in the day would have bought you a bunch of stuff. Well, now you now it doesn't. It's not worth as much. And I don't know what would be, you know, what's worth $97 today. I guess, I guess there's something out there. What is that? A, a full tank of gas on a nice big gas guzzling pickup truck. So now you have to have a hundred dollars, but back in the day. If you had your big gas guzzling pickup truck back in the uh, in 1910, it would have only cost you a dollar to fill the thing up. And so that's how much things have changed over time. And of course, I'm being general here. Correct. I, it might be a dollar fifty or or ninety seven instead of a hundred or whatever. You get you get what I'm saying. Is that this inflation has happened? The, the dollar has been devalued. And so what is a good money? They used to use some sort of shells, conch shells or something like that, I believe in Africa. And, and so if you had a, a conch shell, it was worth a certain amount. And everybody pretty much agreed that if you wanted a side of beef, you had to it was you had to give this many conch shells. I don't know if it was 10 or 50 or whatever. But there have been a lot of things that we've called money over the years. And so now we're thinking about Bitcoin. It's really in the news. And when I first heard about it back in 2014 or so, I was at a at a convention in San Diego and I, I bought Bitcoin for the first time. And I think it was worth $300 per Bitcoin at that point because it wasn't popular. So why is a Bitcoin, as of this recording roughly $27,000. And only six years ago, it was worth $300. Why that big change in value? And I think this comes down to the punchline. And the punchline is money is really whatever people think that it is. That's what money really is. It's whatever we think it is. So if if I think it is worth something and you think it is worth something and we want to have a transaction, we want to exchange a thing of value for another thing of value, and we both think something is a, a Bitcoin or a conch shell or a US dollar or an ounce of gold, if we think something is worth something and we agree, then it's worth something. If you don't have anything and I don't have anything and we don't think that a thing is worth anything, then then money doesn't matter, right? But, but let's imagine this. We come across each other out in the middle of a, a scorching, des- scorch, uh, scorching hot desert and you have an umbrella. You have two umbrellas and I have two bottles of water. Well, I want shade and you and you want water. I'm not sure if I gave that example correctly, but you know what I'm saying. <laughs> now we each have something that we can exchange with the other. That's just called bartering. That's not really money. But money comes in when it gets way more complicated than just the two of us. When it's just the two of us out in the desert, it's easy to exchange these things that we each want. 
But that's why money was invented, isn't it? Isn't it because not everybody always wants the bottle of water that somebody else has and not everybody always wants shade and not everybody always wants an iPhone or a pickup truck or a gallon of gasoline or a, a dozen eggs or a side of beef. Because the world is a complex place, lots of people in the world, lots of things in the world that we want to trade with each other. Well, that's why we needed money. That's why money was invented. And now there is a big difference between good money and bad money or worthless money. And if you disagree and you think that bad money is worth something, yeah, then it'll continue to be worth something as long as other people agree with you and they think it's worth something also. But the moment that nobody thinks it's worth anything, it's not worth anything at all. Unless it has some actual intrinsic value, like gold, you know, at worst, you could make a hammer out of gold and it would it would do a good job hammering soft stuff in, I guess. It wouldn't be the greatest for hard things because gold is kind of soft, but at least it would have some value. Whereas Bitcoin or US dollars, if nobody thought either of those things had any value, they wouldn't. They wouldn't have any value whatsoever. They'd be worthless. Let's think show.com. Has anything happened in this crazy year to make you think about your own mortality? Do you know that you are someday going to croak? We tend to deny that death is a really natural part of life. And not talking about dying doesn't make dying not happen. As a nurse and end-of-life caregiver, it was actually when my 25-year-old daughter was dying that the benefits of talking about dying truly hit home. Because we talked about it, Lauren was able to get more of what she wanted as she died, and I got the gift of being able to provide those things for her. Sometimes, being self-centered is the most selfless thing we can do, and there are ways to achieve a potentially happier ending by designing your dying before you croak. My Croak File will help you define your medical and personal care preferences, have the conversations with those you love, and get on with the business of living. We all die. Let's do it better. MyCroakFile.com Welcome back to the Let's Think Show. Today we're talking about money, all types of money. We're talking about gold and Federal Reserve notes and Bitcoin. And we're just kind of exploring various aspects of money. And, you know, it's time we get around to chatting about legality. Some types of money, as time goes on, uh, are less legal to have or to use. And eh, I guess some would say that that would make them less valuable, but not always. And I don't know, maybe some of you know, when gold, uh, was it uh, Nixon, I believe, that sometime in the 70s made gold illegal to have more than just jewelry or something like that? I believe it was him. I believe that was a rough time frame. Well, I don't know. If you had an ounce of silver still hidden under your bed, was it still worth what it was a few days before? Then I guess, you know, if anybody went to a search engine, I guess you could probably look at gold prices over time or, or gold prices chart last hundred years. or That would probably be something you could look at and see. Uh, if you were curious about it, to see kind of how it's how it's gone up and down over time. That's the issue with Bitcoin that that I've been concerned about for a lot of years as I thought about going out and buying a bunch back in 2014. Of course, now I wish I had. I thought about it again in 2017, and I thought about it in 2018. When, when was it that it was so crazy high price? Was that the beginning of 2018? end of 2017, something like that. I don't know. I got really excited then, and I thought about getting heavily involved in it. 
Well, what are the legalities, though? Back then, especially in 2014, 15, 16, there were a lot of people that thought that it was illegal and and you had to speak in hushed tones. Well, why would a government care if you came up with some kind of wacko, funny money, electronic, digital money? Why would they even care? That's a good question. And that gets us into the Federal Reserve. And I'm not going to go on and on about it. There are plenty of people that are willing to do that. And you can read The Creature from Jekyll Island and learn all about how the Federal Reserve came into being and, and why they exist. And it's a very, very important book that I wish everybody would read. But that'll tell you all the details. I'm not going to go into all of it right now. But long story sh- short, <clears throat> the Federal Reserve is a private bank. It's a private bank that has a deal with the government, with the United States government, to kind of control the money supply and make sure that there, there are no depressions or, or nothing crazy goes on uh, in, the, in the economy. And, and they're there to just kind of make sure everything's okay. At least if you read a sixth grade uh, government or social studies book in a, in a public school, that's what they'll tell you. And there, there are still some adults and some highly intelligent ones, just people that haven't read into it or or looked into it that still believe that that's the case. But really, the Federal Reserve is a private bank. And so what they do is, in essence, they try to get their clients, which are primarily governments, to borrow money from them. And so they'll go to the government and say, hey, uh, if you guys want to make a loan, we'll give you a good interest rate. You sure there's nothing you want? <clears throat> the government says, oh, oh no, we're, we're doing OK. And the Federal Reserve thinks, well, how can we how can we get them to borrow some money? And, and that's what a lot of in the free market and the private banks, they, they kind of do the same thing, too. Right. They try to get you to buy a refrigerator or a car and they don't really care if you have a car, but they definitely want to make the interest on the loan to you. Well, no different with the other private bank, the Federal Reserve. They don't but they want to make loans. That's how banks make money. So they have to convince governments to borrow it. And one of the ways they do that is by creating or at least exaggerating uh, crises. And they come up with something that's really scary. And they say, oh, my gosh, the the people on from the other side of the hill, they're talking about coming over and hurting us. And and we better we better buy a bunch of guns so we can protect ourselves. And the government says, oh, well, God, yeah, we don't. We, yeah, people kind of count on us to protect them. So, yeah, we probably should borrow some money and buy some guns. And the gun manufacturers say, yeah, that's a that's a good idea. <laughs> And then, of course, the same bankers are going over to the people on the other side of the hill and they're saying, hey, just so you know, they're they're buying a bunch of guns over here on this side. They just borrowed some money and they're buying a bunch of guns and we think they might be coming after you. And the people over there go, oh, my gosh, we can't have that. Well, government folks over there say, well, would you give us a loan so we could buy some guns and defend ourselves? The bank says, you know, we're here to help. We just want to help. You betcha. We'll we'll make a loan to you, too. And so they go out and they rile up trouble. They rile up problems. So anytime you see a big, wide-scale problem, you know there's probably a central bank behind it. If you ever see that they're, the people on the other side of the hill are planning to come and attack you, or they're... Even if they're not going to attack you, they're going to come over and they're going to be different than you are. So we well, better build a fence and keep them out. Or if you hear that there's a war against drugs or a war against famine or a war against illiteracy or a war against poverty or anytime you hear there's a war against something or there's some big crisis or pandemic or something. I guarantee you, I guarantee you that the central bankers in the United States, the central banker is the Federal Reserve, they're getting phone calls from the government asking for loans. Now, not all the government, you ask your local little small-time congressman or senator or whatever, whether it's a state or federal level, they're not going to, they don't know this is going on. They, they don't realize that they're a, a useful, innocent or useful idiot, whatever the Soviets called them. They, they don't realize that. They're not trying to to put your grandchildren in debt, but 
they kind of go along with it and they say, well, yeah, we, we better be scared. Those people over there are going to come and hurt us. So we'll spend money for guns or vaccines or, or welfare or whatever it is. We'll spend the money. And to spend the money, the Federal Reserve has to give it to them. Well, how does the Federal Reserve get this money? Once they convince governments to borrow money from them, where, do this, where does the Federal Reserve get this money in the first place? They print it. It's not backed by gold or Bitcoin or conch shells or anything else of value. They just print it. They just go over. And now, of course, it's it's a digital thing, but you get the point. They walk over to the printer and they hit the print button. They just they send another print job. And all of a sudden, there's another billion dollars. There's another 900 billion. There's another trillion dollars. And that is now introduced onto the Monopoly board game table, into the world, all of a sudden, there's a bunch of new money dumped in there. And it's not backed up by anything. So, of course, when you dump it on the table, the stuff that's there is worth way less. So no longer does a dollar buy a gallon of milk. It's gone up now. There's so many dollars out there, they're just not worth as much. You want a dollar? Nah, I've already got a bunch of them. Back in the day, a dollar was a big deal. So that's kind of how the Federal Reserve works. And it seems like a scam, doesn't it? But because the Federal Reserve loans this money and the congressman goes back home and says, hey, good people of Colorado and hey, good people of California, we know you're hurting because of this pandemic, but we're going to give you a free check for $600 or $1,200 and we're going to stimulate the economy or we're going to buy a fighter jet and save you from the scary people that were planning to come over the hill and hurt us. And you're thinking, oh my gosh, thanks guys, really appreciate that. Good thing the government's given me the money, at least it's just coming from out of nowhere. it's free money. <laughs> Who's going to pay that? You think the Federal Reserve? Their whole thing is collecting interest on this and then refinancing when people have a hard time paying. I shouldn't say people, when the government has a hard time paying, they just refinance it with different terms. But you still owe. Until you die, and then your kids owe, and then your grandkids owe, and then your great grandkids owe. And there are these, you know, the sovereign man concept where you you just say, "Hey, I don't want to be part of the system. I'm not. I'm not involved in it anymore." And, and there are ways of doing that. Now, whether or not the government actually recognizes that in the long run, they'll, they'll leave, leave a lot of people alone just because people that are into that are kind of long winded and and and. Uh, kind of preachy and not that likable. Not all of them, but a lot of them. And so I think a lot of government folks just like, okay, just get out of my face. I don't, I'll let you go on this one. Not because I think you're right, but because I don't want to deal with it right now. And so they'll kind of walk away and, and let the people get away with it. But unless you're part of the sovereign man movement and it actually works, <laughs> your great, great, great grandkids are going to be paying off the interest on that $600 of free money you got, or you got the payroll protection plan uh, money for your business. You said yes to that, and you didn't repay it. You got it forgiven. Your great-great-grandchildren are paying off that interest, that debt for many, many, many years to come. Well, now this, this picture I'm painting of the Federal Reserve kind of sounds nasty, doesn't it? Kind of sounds like it's not something we like, not something that we want to be involved in. Seems like there could be a better way for us to exchange value with each other, right? That's where Bitcoin comes in. That's where gold comes in. That's where barter comes in. Now, we haven't even talked about another aspect, have we? We haven't talked about taxes yet. Taxes. We're 
taught as children that obedience to authority is a virtue and that doing as you're told makes you a good person. And all of the worst tyrannies in history depended upon people believing that. In reality, being moral means following your conscience and doing the right thing even when authority tells you not to. Show.com. So what's the deal with taxes and uh, as it relates to, to what we're discussing today? Well, taxes are an interesting thing. The government wants to get your taxes, obviously. That's that's what they do. How, how do they how, how do they go about this? How, how, what do they tax you for? Do they do they tax you when you earn money? Yes. Do they tax you when you spend money? Yes. Do they tax you every single chance they get? Absolutely. So I've gone in a long roundabout way here. Do you know now why the government doesn't like gold coins and silver coins and Bitcoin in the hands of civilians? The reason they don't like that is because if you have a Bitcoin, you have today what's valued at about $27,000. So you could take two or three Bitcoins and go get a really nice new pickup truck. And if you bought that pickup truck from a dealer who accepted it, the owner of the dealership, and he said, I'm just going to pocket these Bitcoins, in essence, and I'm not going to tell the government about it, which was easy to do until a year or two ago. That's a problem for the government, right? They don't get to steal or not. Well, I call it stealing. A lot of people call it theft or tax or whatever, but, the, but they don't get to take a percentage off of the top. The local county doesn't get to take 6% off the top. The feds don't get to take a little slice of the pie or as the, the Mexicans call it, mordida, a bite of the dog, a little bribe or a little, a little, little tax off the top of it. They don't get to do that if they can't record it and control it. So that's why governments want to control money. Have you been to Asia recently? Have you been to China or Japan? Have you tried to exist with just cash? You can't. They look at you like you're crazy. They want you to hold your phone up to pay for things. You have to hold your phone up to be scanned and it comes out of your your digital wallet do you think maybe somebody's looking at that and keeping an eye on it now they're not going to care if you buy a cup of black coffee for two dollars and you don't pay a tax on that like that's not what they're looking for but they're going to make sure the coffee shop is collecting on everything they're going to make sure they're doing a reasonable amount of business you buy a car you buy a house make a big transaction like that they need to know that so that they can take their little share off of the top. So is Bitcoin this anonymous thing that nobody can control or, or track or know what's happened in the past? No, nope. it's hard to control perhaps, but you don't have to control Bitcoin if you can control the human mind. For example, if you said to a bunch of people, hey, you know that those two things you, you breathe out of, <laughs> your nose and your mouth? I'd like you to cover that up and make it really hard for you to breathe, and you should be really scared. Well, if you can get a nation of people to do that, <laughs> then you could probably get them to use your, uh, your digital money, the tracking stuff. You can get them to be honest with you and say, hey, just so you know, I bought some Bitcoin. I just sold some Bitcoin. I should probably give you... 2% or 6% or 18% or 70% off of the top. If you have a domesticated people, then yeah, I guess you're in kind of good condition if you're a bad guy, if you're a government. And you can get the people to be domesticated so that they are law-abiding. That's a disgusting term. Or law-abiding, tax-paying citizen. How embarrassing. What a slave mentality to say that with pride. 
law-abiding, tax-paying citizen? I, I, I mean, uh, am I off base? I mean, are there ever laws that are not good laws? Now, I can see if you said, I'm a moral person who does what's right, but that's not being law-abiding. Why would somebody be proud of, of obeying their masters? Why not be proud of doing what's right? Doesn't that make more sense? Doesn't that seem like that would make a person a better person? To me, to me, that's way more important. But I've gone off on another tangent here. Let's get back to money. Let's get back to, to why the government doesn't like Bitcoin and what you can do about it. So am I going to come on the radio here? If I even knew, am I going to come on the radio and try to tell you how you can cheat the government? Absolutely not. That's a choice you would have to make if you're brave enough to do it. Now, in my situation, I have a couple cars and I have some real estate. And if I try to cheat the government, if I try to stop them from stealing from me, then they're going to come back and they're going to hurt me really bad. They're going to take my house away. They're going to take my cars away. So they've got me scared enough. I'm, I'm a coward. So I'm not going to fight them. So I'm not going to tell you the strategies for the person who did want to stop the government from stealing any or as much money. There are certain cryptocurrencies. Bitcoin is just one of them. It's a popular one. There's, there's Bitcoin. There's Dash. There's Monero. Now, Monero is one that if you want to have privacy, it's used a lot from what I understand by you know, Christian missionaries and such that want to get Bibles to, to China. It's, it's not as traceable of a type of cryptocurrency. So if you're trying to do something like that that's illegal in a certain country, uh, if you're not a law-abiding citizen, uh, it, then Monero is, a, is an option. But it does get complicated. And I got to warn you, when you start getting into cryptocurrencies, when I tried two years ago, I would ask my buddies, and I have friends that are into cryptocurrency, and they're, they're all these really smart, voluntarist, computer engineer, geeky, nerdy types. And you'd ask them and say, well, how do I get Bitcoin or Monero or Dash or whatever? And, and they'd say, well, it's really easy. You just got to change your programming system to Linux, and then you download the Megabyte camshaft uh, heifer, blah, 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 blah. And, you're, well, and that's really easy. <laughs> that's the that's response you get. Well, I'm not a techie kind of guy. I don't understand any of that. So, uh, you know, maybe you can get a friend. If you have one of those friends that is really into that and you trust them, have them get you set up. They'll, they'll set you up with it. And I'm not saying to do an illegal thing, but get a wallet, like a, a Jax Liberty wallet, J-A-X-X -X Liberty. If you go to an app store, they're available there. And that'll, that's a kind of a way to hold on to your cryptocurrency. Not all of them. You can't hold Monero there, but you can hold Bitcoin and Dash and Litecoin and Ethereum. These are all different cryptocurrencies I'm mentioning. But really, get, get that geeky friend of yours. Have them help you get it all set up. And uh, that, that's the way to go. Now, how is this stuff secured? If you're going to go this cryptocurrency route and you get your Jack's wallet, which is it's just an app on the, the phone or on the computer. You can get it on your computer as well. Once you have that, well, now what? How do you get any Bitcoin into it? Now, there are some, some exchanges they're called, like, uh, yeah, I'm trying to think of any right now, and it's slipping my mind. mind. I think Coinami might be one. There's, uh, there have been some that have made the news, but if you just look up cryptocurrency exchange, you'll see a bunch of them. Coinbase, I think that's the big one. Well, they are big, normal companies. So if you buy from them, the U.S. government is definitely tracking you. And they're going to know every penny or hundredth or thousandth of a Bitcoin that comes in and out of it. They're going to be tracking that. And if you're a big enough fish, they'll hold you responsible for it. And they'll come back to you in a year or two or three and say, hey, show me your Bitcoin. And if you say, well, I got rid of all of it, they're going to say, well, we assume you sold it at its highest. You bought it at $5,000 and you sold it at $27,000. So you owe us $22,000, uh, whatever multiple of tax it is. You owe us 10% of $22,000. So give us your $2,200 unless you can prove otherwise. What are you going to do? You're going to do the old joke of, I lost all my Bitcoin and guns in a boating accident. 
IRS agents already heard that one. I wish that would work, but they've already heard that one. So unless you can show it to them, they're going to steal from you. Or if you refuse, if you want to play, play ignorant, they'll seize your property, your car, your house, whatever like that. So how else could you get it? Well, you could put something out on Facebook or on some other social media platform like Float or something. And you could say, hey, I'm interested in getting into cryptocurrency. Can anybody give me advice? Anybody locally that could help me show me on my phone how to do it? And because cryptocurrency folks are kind of geeky, nerdy, highly intelligent, not that good socially, you'll get three or four comments about you being a moron because you didn't get into it in 2014 and somebody else saying it's really easy, just download a megabyte camshaft, Linux, blah, 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 and your hard drive camshaft. And you're going to get a few of those, but then you're also going to get a friend that calls you later or sends you a text message. They're not going to respond to you on Facebook because that's that's all trackable. But they're going to get a hold of you and they're going to say, I've got a buddy that, that sells Bitcoin and uh, you just you mail him 200 bucks and when he gets it, he'll see what the Bitcoin rate is and he'll give it to you minus 3% or 5% or whatever. And so that's a, that's a way to get it. Um, when I got mine in 2014, uh, <laughs> I spent it at the same convention. Now I feel like an idiot. And, and at a convention, there were plenty of people walking around selling it. There were booths and such. And, and it's, it's not like I'm kind of making it sound like, you know, people don't want to put it on Facebook and everything. Uh, it's not a big illegal thing. It's, it's completely legal. The only part that would be illegal would be if you didn't uh, let the government steal from you. The rest of it's legal. And by the way, I also mentioned the big fish are the ones that are going to get uh, checked out and busted and such. Well, you know how they do it. You know how the government works. There are also going to pick some, uh, you know, probably a school teacher or a police officer or something like that. And they're going to create a big story about how this person uh, had a $600 increase and they didn't pay their taxes on it. And therefore, these people are going to prison for seven years. Well, that's just a scare tactic to make sure everybody else pays them what they want to steal. Uh, so don't fall for that. But, you know, it could be you. It could be me. So that's why I choose to do it above board. But you choose whatever you want. Let's think show.com. Welcome back to the Let's Think Show, letsthinkshow.com. We are available via podcast. Uh, if you want to catch up on old shows or listen to this one again, SoundCloud has us. Uh, we're on a bunch of platforms. Just, just go to letsthinkshow.com and you'll find links there to all of our good stuff. Today we're talking about various kinds of money and we've been chatting uh, specifically the last little bit about Bitcoin and the various ways of getting it, whether you get it from Coinbase or one of the big exchanges, or if you get it, private party. When you get it from person to person, then the IRS would like you to keep track of it. And if you if you got $100 worth now and in a year it's worth 200 and you sell it, they would like you to contact them and say, hey, I made 100 bucks selling this. I would like to give you Mr. Government, 10% or 18% or or 33% or whatever of it. That's what they would like you to do, and they're going to expect you to keep track of it. So once you actually have it on your phone, well, I guess I should tell you how you get it on your phone. This money goes to your buddy's friend, Bill, across town or across the country or across the world, and they then send it to you because your local friend has shown you how to send your key, your public key. And what that is, is a big, long series of numbers and letters and symbols. And you copy and paste it, you send it to the person, then that's the address that they send the money to you. And you're looking there 
at your phone and all of a sudden it'll pop up and it goes from zero to you have a hundred and ninety five dollars let's say you got uh, two hundred dollars worth now you all of a sudden you have uh, 195 190 dollars worth of bitcoin and you're like hey this is pretty cool and you set it down and you go to the bathroom and you come back and you pick it up and you look at it and it's gone down to 185 dollars you're like, oh, this is a horrible investment. And then a month later, you look at it, and now it's up to 250 bucks. It's an exciting roller coaster. But you can kind of watch it go up and down. And then you might want to exchange some of it. Bitcoin isn't good for small transactions back and forth. But you decide you want to help your friend get into it, and you want to give them five free dollars. Well, you don't want to give it to them in Bitcoin because it costs you about five bucks to give five bucks. So it's just it's not worth doing. It used to be back in the day, but it's not anymore. So it's probably better off using a different cryptocurrency, something like Dash. So you can do an exchange within this wallet. You just push a few buttons and you essentially sell Bitcoin. Somebody gets a little tiny percentage. It's not like 3% or anything. It's less than 1%. They take their little less than 1% and then they give you that amount in Dash. And so now you have Dash. So now you and I run into each other on the street and you say, hey, I really appreciate your show, Shepard. I'd like to give you a $20 donation. And I say, well, I sure appreciate that. I pick up my phone and I open up my wallet and I show you my QR code, one of those little square things with all the funny squiggly lines in it. And you pick up your phone and you aim it at my code and you punch in $20 goes to Shepard and you hit the send button and instantly that money's in my wallet. Now, it does take a little bit of time because it has to go through some intermediaries. I'll see it immediately, but it won't be confirmed. But within a few minutes or an hour, depending on the cryptocurrency, Dash and Bitcoin and all of them are different. But within an hour, it'll all have come through. And uh, now I'll have 20 bucks. Now I can go spend that how I want or do what I want with it. Now, if you sold that and made $1.83 profit since the time you bought it, a few weeks ago, that dollar eighty-three is what the U.S. government would like you to write down in your own little notebook and say, "I made a dollar eighty-three, and I would like to give you twenty percent of it, thirty percent of it, whatever the tax rate is." So that's kind of sort of how it goes, and and you can tell I don't know that much about it. Uh, I, I'm not as complex or into it as a lot of these geeky type folks are, but. Uh, there, there are some really nice people and I've kind of made fun of my geeky, nerdy friends, but these people are really high IQ folks and maybe they're not always the most customer servicey and easy to get along with. And they might want to make you feel like a fool and they might expect you to know stuff you don't know, but there are quite a few of them that really want to help you out. And if they're your friend, you already know their personality, just put up with it. They're going to help you do something that is the future of money. I was going to say it could be good for you later. I don't know if if prices are going to go up. That shouldn't be the reason you buy a cryptocurrency. It shouldn't be a, an investment. It's a speculative thing at, at best. It's just the new way of money. It's 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 how you you know you you trade in your 8 tracks for a cassette tape and then you trade it in your cassettes for a CD and now you've traded that in for digital music, MP3 stuff and you just like the old Federal Reserve note dollar bill that you hand around, that's that's not the future of money. Blockchain cryptocurrency is. Now, it's going to be Bitcoin because it's popular. It's a great target for the government. Uh, a number of other ones are going to be very mainstream and, and the government's going to learn how to trace and track all of them. Some of these geeks are going to lose a bunch of their Bitcoin, but they're really smart and the government's going to come to them and say, hey, come work for us and help us bust all of these tax cheats. And they're going to do it. They're going to lower themselves to that level. They're going to go do it. And that's sad, but they will do it. So don't think you're going to get into any cryptocurrency. You're going to spend 100 bucks now, and it's going to be worth $10,000 five years from now. Maybe it will be. Maybe. But don't do it for that reason. Do it because you've researched it and it seems like a good thing you want to do. The security for Bitcoin, 
let's the same thing with gold same thing with cash right we want to make sure that nobody steals uh the money that we have whether that money is a paper form or a, a precious metal or a digital uh money we just want to make sure that nobody steals it most of us want to make sure of that some of us are okay with uh the government taking it because if it's taxation therefore it's okay some people hold that world view and that's their prerogative, but we definitely don't want anybody that isn't government. I think everybody can agree that that we don't want anybody that doesn't call themselves government to steal any of it. So how do we secure it? Well, with Bitcoin, uh, it's a you know all the the computer geeks they have they've got this stuff figured out as best they can, and yet stuff still gets hacked. Uh, but so how do you protect your, your Bitcoin? Well, I don't know. Uh, chances are most of us aren't going to have huge quantities. If you're going to have so much that it's a huge concern, you know, if you're going to buy $3 million worth or $100,000 with worth, make sure you have a good, trustworthy person, not just somebody you met on the interwebs, but somebody who you really have known for years and trust that can help you work through the whole process. Uh, it's not worth having that stolen. Um, uh, and beyond that, the kind of the way the technology works is that there is a, a key, a private key, and it's not really an account. It's not an account like you think about you have a bank account. Eh, it's not really that. Uh, it, it's different. And, and the geeks can explain it. Well, evidently they can't explain. I've had it explained to me so many times and I still don't get it. Maybe I'm just slow, but... Long story short, you'll have 12 words or 24 words that when you're in Jack's Liberty in that wallet, it's going to ask you to if you want to write your keys down and secure them. So then you get a piece of paper and you write down the, the words and it'll be a series of words. And one word might be dolphin and the next word might be synthetic and the next word cheat and so on and so forth, until you have tw either 12 or 24, I'm not sure. It's been years since I've done this. Once you have all of those words, you've written them down perfectly. Don't get even one letter wrong. Now you have those words, you can, your phone can burn up the next day, and you can have those words, and you can show up at a public computer, a buddy's computer, a tourist who let you, let you borrow their phone, you can show up in Zimbabwe with that phone hooked to the interwebs, type in those keys into a, a Jack's wallet or any other wallet, and voila, there is all of your cryptocurrency. So that's kind of a handy thing, isn't it? And so there are differences between, I think they're called paper wallets or hard wallets, and there are these little uh, like USB uh, memory card kind of things, Tracer or Razor or something like that, and you can download it onto there somehow. Uh, I I bought a couple and then it looked too complicated. So I gave those up. But long story short, even the way that I've explained this, and I'm sure not very complex in my understanding, it's complicated. So if you're going to get into it, do yourself a favor and listen to a few hours worth of YouTube videos to at least get a basic understanding. Or if you're a reader, read some articles on it. Uh, there's one particular YouTube video from Andronopolis, somebody, I'll, I'll link it in the show notes uh, for, and this is uh, Let's Think Show 10. Uh, I'll link it in the, the show notes and you'll be able to kind of look at that and watch that video. It's, it's motivational. It kind of gives you a little bit better idea of, of what Bitcoin is. Uh, and if you lose that wallet, by the way, I lost the the keys, the, the 24 words, I lost them. And I thought I had them. Like I have them on a piece of paper and I typed them in, but evidently I got them wrong. So that is completely gone. Now, fortunately, I bought $300 worth, I think. And then I spent 200 and high 200s, like 260 or 70 bucks worth. So it'd still be a few hundred bucks now if I had it, but don't buy a bunch of it and then be sloppy with your with your letters or your uh, words. Uh, I, I certainly learned that lesson. Well, what do you think? Bitcoin, cold, 
U.S. Federal Reserve notes, conch shells, I don't know. Money is an interesting thing. Thank you for joining me. Thank you for uh, considering, considering this stuff. Most people don't think about it. You're above average. Thanks for being above average. Thanks for being a thinker here on the Let's Think Show. Let's Think Show.